Well, I'll tell you some fishing time again. And being an all-round angler, I figured it's well overdue for me to get out on the river. But I thought, hang on, I've got a really good film up on a river that I had in the file from last year. I saved it, I was going to put it up in one of our many lockdowns to give you guys something to watch. I've just found it in the files. It's one of the best ones that I feel I've enjoyed up there and I think you might enjoy it as well. Sit back, relax and let's get barbel fishing on the River Wye. Mmm, my favourite. Well guys, welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. I'm down here on the Herefordshire water, um, fishing on a place that Woody told me to come out, Woody's Tackle Shop in Hereford. If you need any info, go to Woody. He'll set you up with baits, rigs, and more important, where to go. He can't put the fish on the hook, of course, but at least he can point you in the general direction. It's just a regular day to get water, but I had a really good day here last year, and what I want to do is give it another go, because I learned something about possibly feeding and the fact that the fish weren't taking static baits. I was getting one or two barb on static baits, maybe one or two chub, but then I changed to a rolling bait and bingo, lunch and meat did it. So I'm wondering if they haven't had any storms and it's pretty much the same conditions, is it gonna work again? I'm pretty sure it will. What I'm gonna do first though, because when I first came down here, I can't get down here early guys. I mean, I live like 220 odd miles away or whatever. I get down there, there's a gentleman here. Fair play, he caught one small chub, half a pound, pound, something like that. And he was in what I would call the wrong place, but too far up where there's snags. So I thought, I just moved downstream. I thought, this is me done, I'm gonna get, I'm, I'm totally stuffed. I really wanted to try this particular area. And I just turned around, I just chucked some ground bait in and I just saw a figure go past, but I saw a, a, a pole, a landing net thing, I thought, is that the guy that was in this swim? Because generally people would go from the car park, he'd been here since six this morning, it's 25 to 11 on wash time. They would generally walk this way, leapfrogging their way up if they moved. I found it difficult at this time of the day to, if he's worked his way up there, would he want to fish back this way or would he want to go to the car somewhere totally different? I thought, it's a big gamble. I piled all my gear back in and finally, yes, I was right. He had packed up and gone. So here I am. Am I going to do better than one chub? I certainly hope so. But first, because I'm late to the party, I'm going to put some ground bait balls in. I'll show you what I'm doing. I've got some Bailey's feed, horse feed, some brand. I've mixed it about 50-50, because last time I mixed it, it was pretty stiff. I've made six ground bait balls, and the reason I'm going to pound these in is because I have, you know, I've, I've, put, I've put all my bait in the other swim and then move within five minutes. That's going to break up like this. You can see that. I'll go down. So that, when it breaks up, is not a million miles away from the size of my feeder. So effectively, I'm really putting in six big giant feeders initially to get them going. And then I've got to follow up with my feeder. So out we go. Great care to uh, not fill up. Now, I want to go, snakes are up there, I know the snakes are up there, about there, if it's going to roll down, that one broke, so I'm going to try not spinning it, that's a big one, that's made a much better bloop, when it makes that bloop noise, and I'll show you what I've got here as well, let's squeeze them tight, I'll let them let them just dry a bit. 
these are big big balls and I'm going to follow up and then I aim to feed it up but at the end of the day I want to go out here as far as I can get in Wellingtons like this Ooh. that broke that didn't make the right bloop Ooh. that's a better one I'm going to follow up with my feeder This is just a straight running ledger, homemade feeder. Hell look. It's a straight running ledger rig. Got a bead there, homemade feeder. Single pellet, just there, about four foot tail. I'm bound to lose gear, it's just the way it is down here on the Y. Let it sink. I pump it once. Spin off a bit of line. And then fix. I do this buzzer just so I can tell if I'm looking away, messing around like I was just now filming. I don't want to hear a splash as the rod got in. The other thing I'm going to do just for now is just going to put this bag on the butt, so I want to film you that to I'll get a second one out in a minute but listen, just a little tip, we used to do this down the Hampshire Raven a lot with maggots, probably said it before, you get your ground bait ball and now what you can do, I've got pellets mixed in here you can make a cup, put some maggots in and close it up or you could do what I do, you push a stone in there like this which makes it sink down to the bottom better Squeeze it nice and tight because the minnows will break it up. Don't worry about it being too tight. The, everything in the river is just carried downstream and I'm banking on this ground bait up here attracting fish just down there before it goes over the rapids. Rapids, you've got to laugh, about two inches high. I'm going to chuck one way up there. That's it. So there's a good bit of feed going in there. That'll be breaking up while I rig up my second rod. I think you're clear. Thank you. You could net it for me, actually. So I've got a barbell hooked up, guys. Haven't even got the second rod together on the feeder. So maybe, maybe that uh, just paid off that, that bombardment, that initial bombardment. Wow, he's going really well. I just don't want him coming up towards a snag. He's taking line off me, so it must be decent fish. Ah, he's taking more line off me. Taking more, he's taking his digging. I'd say he's going for a snag, my gut feeling. I'm going to walk back sometimes. Doing this, dropping to wind, is all it takes. The fish's head turns, and then he can, he can get away again. Now I'm losing again. Then the minute his head's turned there, look, I walk backwards constant pressure I'm out of camera shop I'm still walking backwards and then he's going away again but I can follow him down hang on a second guys I can't get in the camera shop because I'm trying to maintain the maximum on this because this might be a nice fish I'll turn over this way for you I haven't seen anything yet I think I'm clear of any Weed, they tell me there's not a huge amount of weed in the river. I'm looking like I can't see the fish at all. Oh, I can see him up here. He's gone upstream, so I think I'll have to keep maintain a constant even pressure. Don't try and horse a barbel, it's going to break you off. When they do that digging, you've just got to let the rod take, take the force. Cushion it, that's what it is, it's a cushion. The rod is a cushion, like a spring. Now that one, ironically, I had my head down, rigging up the second feeder, and I heard the buzzer go, you know, beep, beep, only two beeps, because it's not gonna run line it, it just shows me that the, the rod butt was starting to lift off the ground. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? This is a nice fish, five pounds, I guess. Good river wide barbel. Okay, I'm gonna drop the mic, guys. I've got the mat down here, and I'll see if I can get in and get it for you.
So there's a beauty, people. Look at this one. Lovely. First fish of the day. Lovely barbel. I don't know, five, six pounds, something like that. Let's get this one straight back. No, barbel, fish called a barbel. They, get, they do get salmon in here, but uh, not many. Yeah, I think they, like everything, fishing's getting hard all the time with pollution and everything like that. There used to be a lot of salmon in there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's got a British record, I think it's something like, I think they've had 60 pound fish out. Monsters. About six. Well, it's very rare for me to get an early fish like that first cast on the river barbel fishing. Generally it takes a while to build the swimmer. Well, I'm wondering perhaps that guy was here, he's float fishing. There he had one small chub. He might have been getting a bit of feed going in. And then when I, when he left and I came in, they, they've eaten all the food he's thrown in, possibly looking, looking for other food. Then I've bombarded it with five, six, seven balls of ground bait, followed up with two feeders. They might have stimulated them again, who knows? Well pleased to get one bubble like that and to get it out because it's so snaggy. I'm hoping I'm below the snags. But what I want to do is build the swim up here and then later, it's only five past 11, later in the day, if it goes dead on the pellets, and I'm sure it will go dead, um, I want to try rolling luncheon meat, getting it what we call balanced. So it just bumps through the stones and your touch ledger in feeling for bite. There's no buzzers, there's no rod crashing over. You just feel a tap through your fingers. Possibly you might be able to see the rod top tweak you know and you can also see the line stop when it's going through and you get it just bumping just right people who do trundling luncheon meat will know what I mean it just stops and sometimes it's the bottom and sometimes it stops but with a tweak which is an officious grab the luncheon meat or just moved off station like this so you've got to move that far so if you can imagine the bow in the line it stops tweaks that's fish hit it I used to write about that method with float called trundling years ago about 40 years ago when I used to write for the angling magazines. And because the angling magazines of its time way back then were the best ones because they were all pioneer anglers. There's none of this, you know, ultra cult tackle, the latest and greatest. What it was then was more watercraft than actual bits of tackle. The tackle was sort of neither here nor there. If you had half a reasonable tackle, you'd catch fish. But what it was then was the watercraft. Now it all seems instant, instant, instant. You need all the gear. The saying is, all the gear and no idea. I think a lot of people just go fishing, they don't really get into thinking about what's going on underneath the surface, the current, the flow. Like, very windy today, you can't tell it in here because we're down in, in the valley of the river. There's lots of leaves going down. So I can tell by the speed of those leaves where the most current is. And that's where I'm, I'm wanting to be in the main flow because the barbell lights being in that fast current, just moving across like this, intercepting food as it comes down. So give this five, ten minutes, and I think I'll have a recast. Come on, boys. What is that? I think I'm on. I might have missed that one. Yeah, I missed him. Got a feeling that was a chub. Should have been faster on that one. There you can see the pellet's gone, but the band's still there. That was me messing around with the camera and losing another fish. I missed a couple more bites. Good pull downs, but I got a feeling they're chub. Anyway, I was told by really, really good feeder fisherman, barbel fisherman, back on the Hamish Raven years ago, 60s, mid 60s, late 60s. His name was Jack Harrigan. 
He had a swim named after him down there, Jack. I fished it, Jack Harrigan swim. And I used to talk to him when I used to go down there. And uh, he was talking about feeding. A couple of pointers for you. He said, don't bother going early in the season, the first few weeks. And I said, why is that then, Jack? Because he said, the feed hasn't gone in with the swim feeders. Let other anglers get the fish going for you. Early in the season, they don't feed that well. So he said, I'm talking barbel here, just totally, he was totally barbel. And I've sort of always imagined mid-July onwards I started. Having said that, you know, I have picked off, off fish up on slower moving rivers, but on faster rivers, he says, that's when they generally get going. It's uh, when the anglers have got the feed in and they're moving to a swim and they're waiting for the feed almost. Another thing he said, he was fishing away and he's, he used to catch, honestly, I think he used to catch 10 barbel a day. Just, it was no big deal for Jack to catch 10 barbel a day. And I used to say, because I was younger, which side shall I go, Jack? And he always used to say, go upstream. He said, because you can always pull a fish away from a man upstream, you can't pull them downstream because you'll fish him downstream of the fish. So you see, even if you're in a match, the person who's got fish in front of them, if the flow is going this way, you, whoop, nearly, you can, you can pull those fish up off him, which you can't make them turn around and go to you down there. So that's something worth thinking about, which is really why I'm fishing up from this rapids area so that, you know, I can uh, pull fish up from the rapids. We're on, <laughs> spooked all the ducks. Fish on guys, looks like a, a chub, small, very small chub. I think. I've been getting some real small bangs. Yeah, a little chublet. Well, there he is. There he is, guys. That's the pellet he took. Small chub. That's presumably what give me all these little tweaky bites. No more barbel yet, though. I'm not a million miles away from going for my free line lunch of meat. go loaded up again and I'm fishing with a stiffer rod upstream here we go and push let it settle I just bump it once just to empty a bit of feed as well and I'm trying to follow up pretty quickly with the second one downstream with the first that's the theory. A little bit inside. Bump it once, tells me some clear gravel. Down we go. You don't need these by indicators, but I use them because I'm filming. So it does uh, help me filming. I've got in there regular pellets. I've got some of these red pellets. I don't know whether they're krill or what they are. It's what they feed at the trout farms now. Well, not all of them, obviously. Let's show you the difference. Just so, so you know. That's the red one, and then the one I'm using on hook bait. Are these much bigger ones. And they're much, much darker. I feel they've got a high oil content in them. That's why I like using them. And you can see there they've got sort of two short sizes in this one. Just turn it around where. Can you see that? It's very, very slightly bigger. I use that so that the band goes in the middle there when you put the band on. I just feel if it's a small one, it might skid off when I cast. So it just gives the band a bit of movement there. Another little tip that was told me to help hold that band. This is old Mick the bailiff that used to be down here. Why? I think he's no longer with us. He gave me that tip. He said, if you cut a couple of grooves 
I'll just do it there. See the little groove, that's all it takes. One each side. He said that will stop the pellet skidding off. Like that. See that little groove in it? Just use the point of your knife, I'll show you. Just so people know how banded pellet works. These are latex ones. They're tiny and you have have this expander tool there. Hopefully you see this, it's been worn out, this one's old. It's got four four prongs like this. The plunger pushes them apart. All for beginners. Put the band on right, expand it. Whoa, that's a tight one. And then just pop it over and you can see that that's dropped already in that groove there. And then when you hook it, just hook it this side, not the one in the groove. Then that little bit of tension there helps pull it tighter into the groove. Anyway, it's another totally awesome tip for you guys. The fish, if you're not impressed with it, I've not had another bite. What have I bites of that chub? Load of bang there and the pull downs, but for some reason they're not really coming onto it hard. What a setting though. It's a shame really that I'm late to the river. Well, I used to do the Hampshire Raven religiously, 25 years regularly at the peak of the maggot season when they allowed gallon of maggots. We used to have to, you wouldn't catch barbel if you didn't have a gallon of maggots. You used to pay 30 shillings for it, £1.50 for a gallon of maggots. We used to buy half hundred weight sacks of ground bait. My goodness, maybe you got through some fee, but you catch fish. Then they banned the maggots. I suppose they thought it was catching too many fish. And uh, <clears throat> we had to go to lunch and meat, and that's when we started developing more the art of rolled lunch and meat and a method called trundling, which is running a float through with the, with the bait over depth and holding the float back so the bait would go in front of it. It's called trundling. It's actually a technique I devised myself. I wrote about it back in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s in the magazines. So trundling would still work now. And we had to because you couldn't lose feed half a hundred weight of lunch and meat, could you? Bear in mind, lunch and meat was a lot cheaper then. It still works now, lunch and meat, and I aim to find you some fish over there, guys. From over there, where that broken branch is, down there, if I can find a run that I can roll that meat through. That's why I don't mind feeding for two or three, four hours here, even though I'm not catching with a swim feeder. I don't mind feeding that up because I'm pretty sure they're gonna be taking, if they're not coming to the feeder, up to the swim feeder, they might be taking baits down the bottom there. Look, this is a way to look at it, people. Look, you've got to think like a fish. I'm sorry, you've got to think like a fish. In my case, I know I smell like a fish. That's because I catch fish. Now, you've got to think like a fish. Now, if you've anchored with a swim feeder here in a river, the particles of food are going down, aren't they? Up comes Mr. Barbel and or Chub, whatever you're fishing for, but let's, in this case, Barbel. He's coming upstream, upstream, upstream. He's picking off little bits and pieces. He gets closer to the feeder. And he's got all the time in the world to either take that bait or not take that bait. Okay, when he takes it, he generally will turn downstream and that gives you the rod wrenching pull that the barbel are so famous for. However, if you think under natural conditions, there's nothing anchored on the riverbed. I just had a big bang then, it got bang like that. Pull back almost, it's almost a slack line bite. Everything is moving, moving, moving. All food particles getting bounced and trundled along the bottom. So from the fish's point of view, they've got to take it absolutely straight away. They've got to take it as it goes past them. They don't have a choice. If they don't take it as it's coming past their face, it's behind them, the fish behind is going to get it. So very often that method, if they're not coming on one static bait, so I'm going to call it, they'll come on the trundling along the gravel bed of the river. Um, in this case, unfortunately, there's lots of boulders out there. But generally, you know, on a gravel bed, you can just bump that big piece of lunch of meat all the way along. I use bigger pieces of lunch of meat. I find them a bit buoyant. I'll show you later on. Um, I'm going to give it, I'll probably give it till just after lunchtime, have a bit of lunch, and then uh, we'll get set up for it. So something to think about. Are you going to go static with the swim feeder and wait for the fish to come to you? 
However, all that feed's going downstream, why don't you wind in and either go down with a float or go down free lining, trundling, bouncing a piece of lunch meat down through that swim and see what's down there. That's one beep, that's a piece of weed on the line, I think. There's a sort of secondary reason why I want to try bouncing a piece of free line meat through, and that's because they tell me last year, that's 2020, th all the weed's gone. They say it's been a pollution from whatever, some chicken farm somewhere, uh, put a scum on the water to stop the light getting through to make the weed grow. Other people, the angler I was just talking to, packed up from here, said it was big, big storms gone through, ripped all the weed out. I'm not sure it is that. I'm really not sure it is the storm because historically they had storms for hundreds and hundreds of years, putting flash floods down from the Welsh mountains, whooshing through 12, 14 feet high, huge, massive volumes of water. So I'm not sure there might be something else wrong with it. But from my point of view, those fish haven't got anywhere to hide, they haven't got any sanctuary. So I'm wondering, will there be a deterioration because the predators like they the intelligent people that stop the otters, lovely, lovely, stop the otters. Now the otters can get right to all those stock. They can get right to the fish. There's before the fish could hide in amongst the weed. Now they can't. Also, small fry like to harbour into the weed for safety, for sanctuary, from other fish, from other predators. They can't do that either. They've got no sanctuary. You know, it's not looking good, is it, for us, really? So the fact there's no weed, it's good for me being able to run a bait through. But maybe a year or two, the fishing won't be so good. And then we'll wonder why, and it's probably because there is no weed. Because me, the weed will be snagging. It'll be snagging my piece of meat. I'd only have short areas to actually bump it through. The old rivers really are under the cosh compared with what they were like when I was a kid. Full of fish, fabulous, plenty of water, clear fresh water now. Man, everything, everything is on the deteriorating side. So I'm fishing while I can. Guys, I'm doing this, right? <laughs> you want a slightly poor flask of tea? I'm having, I'm having my breakfast because there's no B&B of cornflakes. And the rod is taken off and is on the way to the Bristol Channel. That was a take and a half. That was an absolute classic, classic barbel take. And the fish just went like a bat out of hell. It's not a big fish by the look of it. Man, that was some take. Oh, I'm so grateful I'm still on pellet and feeder. Just about was going to help. I thought I'd have my breakfast, which is lunchtime. I think uh, I was just about getting ready to change over to rolled luncheon meat. Here you can see my homemade feeder. Look at it. He's going to take off, boys. He's going to take off when he gets to that shallow water. I've caught enough of these to know. He will not like the shallows. There he goes. Oh, I did, I did say. I did say. I did say. I've caught enough of these to know where they don't like that shallow water. I'm so grateful to get a second barbel. Hardest fight in fish in Britain. What do you guys think? I know what you river fishermen think because you fish for them, but they are an amazing species, are they not? Here he comes. There he goes, like a little bonefish. Digging, 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 what a species. I might get in for this one. Ducks all up there, sunbathing, here he comes. Still not done, still not done. Come on, come to Uncle Graham. No, he's still not done. We're gonna to have to go downstream. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's straight over the rim of the net. Now it's woken him right up. Come on, babe. I'm trying vainfully not to get my uh, wade, well, if it's full of wader type water. He's in this time. My wrist has gone weak, that's why. There you go, boys. Beautiful river wide barbel. I can even unhook him in the water, like we used to do years ago. Hook falls out, look at that. Beautiful. What it's all about, boys, 
backyard. Well, that was a result. I'll go back to my cornflakes now. I had his shirt off time because look at that beautiful sun up there. It's lovely and toasty and warm. I think I'd better stick with the feeder while I just finish my breakfast. At lunchtime. It's breakfast for me. That's totally awesome breakfast, quarter past one in the afternoon. Oh, look at that blue sky. That is so beautiful. Yeah, let's just go for that willow. Not up it, Graham. Not up it, mate. Bang. One bump. Don't move. Just do that one move. One bump to get some feed out and to ensure that I am. And now, of course, I can go back to the second most important thing, the barbel fishing. Ah. Oh, real drag's loose. That is a strange one. Second most important thing, which is brekkie at lunchtime. Mmm. Oh, the milk that's just about to go off, obviously. I suppose it could be cheese. Cheese and cornflakes. Well, something you can think of using when you've got rods up high like this, and especially when you're barbel fishing, you're going to get a crash take. So, obviously I have my bag across here, but I've also got these two little spikes. I don't know where they're from, tent pegs or whatever, but they're just across the width of the butt there. You can see, they just go the other side of the butt. So by putting these in here, so by pushing those spikes in, just like that, I can just rest that so when that rod, if it does up here, pull right down, normally the butt will come flying up. You can see there, just by, you don't have to ram it right under like that. You just put it like that so it can come up against that. And that just saves you losing a rod. It hooks the fish, and providing you've got the drag set here, so line can come off, that just, that just provides, look, a safety factor. Can you see that's just a safety factor? I do the same this side. I always keep these. I'd look, the only time I really use them is margin fishing for carp. Well, I want them strike straight away. I basically just keep hold of the rod. Or when I'm barbel fishing, like this, and I just want that, that tiny bit just holding there. So that as that rod top buckles over, it pulls up against that. The center's here, and hopefully I don't lose the rod. It gives you that extra, extra second of safety, I suppose I want to say, and you don't lose a rod, and you get the fish. Double bonus. Well, it must, on the face of it, seem strange how much ground bait I'm actually getting through here. But if I can just show you in a second, I'll just get these out. Hang on a second, hang on a second. I want to get into a shadow line. I can show you in a minute. Now I just put those hooks that I showed you earlier, just like that. That's pinched in. And I'll try and send both baits out, one after the other. And they're big feeders. So I'll show you these. These are my own homemade ones. Out of garden fencing wire. I'm not going to say call them expendables, I don't want to lose them at all, but they're a lot cheaper to make like that. Trying to get into that shadow line. What I'm trying to say is there are tons and tons of small fish in here and they can demolish 
your ground bait in minutes. I'm going to put a ball of ground bait over here, put the camera in an underwater case and just show you the small fish that come over it and how they can get through it. Of course they don't get through the pellets, that's why we use hard bigger pellets, but the um, small fish do nibble away the ground bait. I actually think that all that activity, all this, all this like this, sends off vibrations downstream and up they come. Here comes a barbel. He hears this vibration. What's going down here? There's a lot of food coming. Pushes him out, shoulders in, bullies his way in, pushes the small fish away, bang. Because very often if you fish maggots like this with a swim feeder, especially a blocking feeder, you'll get tappy, tippy, tappy bites like this with the small stuff's at it. And then all of a sudden it goes quiet. Tip just stays like this. You go, oh, I must have left. Yeah, they've left because the barbel's moved in. Boom, over goes the right top. Right, let's get a ball of ground bait out for you guys. Okay, just look under the ground bait here. After those first couple of fish, you can see there's absolutely a horde of small fish. Most of those I can see can be minnows. They could be, I guess, tiny barbel or what we used to call a stone loach. I like looking at these shots because very often you can spot another species that you didn't know were in there. Gudgeon, stuff like that. But look at that, hammering, and that's what's happening out in the main river. Okay, so clouds come over now. So luckily I just filmed that underwater for you. But I'm gonna try and go out, get my land in there, and just see if I can scoop some of those so you can see and identify what species they are. But they look like all minnows to me. There's hardly anything left. So I'll go out with the net just to see what these fish are. You can actually see, you know, that there's a bit of colour in the water and that's swarming bait. So I just want to show you the fish. If there's anything in that net, I can show you what type of species they are. It's very often you can see what they are. There might be loach, gudgeon, anything in there, but these look appear to be just all minnows. You can see they're all small minnows. Now, as tiny as they are, they are going to demolish your single maggot as it goes down. They're going to have a harder job with the pellet, obviously, but they're certainly going to get through that ground bait. Now, you can see why I use so much ground bait. At this stage, I wish I'd actually brought my waders with me. Out goes a piece of meat to roll around in that lovely wide current. Now, you can't really tell anybody how to free line. You can't. You can sort of... I used to write articles about it. It's very, very difficult to say how much line you should let out, when you should let it out, when you should slack it back, what shot you should wait, wait your line with. And there we go. Oh dear, the language might not be good. I've obviously missed a fish. All you're going to feel is a sort of bump or a tap, or you're going to feel a change in the direction of the bow in the line as it enters the water, like that. Bang, fish on. Now, I can't tell you what made me strike that fast. But as you can see, you need a lightning strike. You've got to be aware of, you know, what there was there. <clears throat> I've obviously had a bump. Yes, it's only a small chub, but as small as that fish is, I still felt the bite. Oh, I love it. It's fallen off again. Still, good job I go out again and get another fish. And this is just rolling as people. Look, if you use a small piece of meat, you're probably, probably just going to catch small chub. I like using a big piece of lunch of meat because I don't really want a really tiny chub of a pound, half a pound, something like that. I'm fine catching them with a float, but you know, I want to get you a decent sized chub like this one. Anything two pounds and upwards, something like that, I figure is a nice fish. And that one, don't forget that chub has got a nice big mouth. He can take a very, very big piece and he's been nipped at the back by an otter by the look of it. That's why I have such a wonderful relationship loving the otters because they are just chewing the tail of as many fish as they can catch. There we go, put that fish straight back. So you can see the benefit of lunch of meat and there indeed I've got another fish hooked up. Basically I'm doing this as a voiceover because the sound on this mic, my son Mike gave me a camera mic that was awfully directional, expensive and totally useless. I like my old one. Load it up this time, guys. I've had about six other chub. It wasn't maggots in that. I don't know what's happened with this camera mic. Something bizarre has happened to it. I'm going to take it off and hang it there. Who knows what you're going to get now? 
hang in the uh, camera right there guys this one's definitely definitely a barbel good sized fish too Which is a sign of a big fish normally when it's going up the river. So nice fish to get on rolled meat. I had a feeling it would work. Beautiful fish. Try and get one lift out of it. Here we go, people. Barbel fish on the river. Why? You've got to have some. Look at that tail. That can generate some power, can't it? Great fish. Let's get him back. Shame I couldn't get the underwater camera for you. I mean, you get these guys underwater, they're really good, but the casing uh, is okay. But there's something that's gone, the battery of the chip's full. And look at that in the sunlight. Brilliant. Just let him recover. That was worth coming all this way for. Oh, and again, guys, I think this is a chub. It is just a good chub. I was just, I was just going to pack up, to be honest, and just go back on the feeder. It just goes to show you, just by looking, you know, for little gullies and gaps in the dark areas where the, the, um, the food might tumble. I've got another fish hooked up. I wonder if it's a small barbell, actually. Chub on at all. Here he comes. What was that trout? It was a bit trouty. No, it's a chub. Well, there we go. A nice little wide chub. Great big tail on it. That's why he gave me such a good fight. So, a result again. Chub, barbel. I was glad I came to this area. I just had a feeling, you know, at the bottom end, there might be, uh, just before those rapids, there might be some fish. Let's get this guy back. Good session. Let's get you go in there and frighten all the minnows. Give him a minute to uh, get his breath back. There he goes. It's quite weird, you know, when they swim away like that, even the barbel. They don't look that big in the water, do they, when they, when they swim off? Hmm. I think it's time for a bit more lunch of meat. I'm going to have about an hour. I've got a 220 odd mile drive home. So, fingers crossed, I could. Well, I'd be pretty happy to hang one more barbel. But uh, I must have had about 10. Eight or ten chub now. Three barbel. Good session, boys. But more meat is required. This is another barbel, I thought it was a chub. And that was right, right at the bottom, just before it runs over the rapids. Well, 
this one's going well. I'm not surprised. I thought it was a chub. It's actually another barbel. Dig it and dig it. Wow. Come on. Not big fish, but they're so powerful. Well, that's four barbel, two on uh, feeder and pellet, but as you'll notice, no more on the feeder and pellet, but two on rolled luncheon meat. There we go. It's a really nice barbel. It's another nice fish. Goodness me. Just there. Really good looking fish. And there indeed, falling off the hook, it's a piece of lunch of meat it was caught on. Great looking fish. Let's get it straight back. Let's let him recover. And you see those gills working. Never let them go, even though you see the gills working. Let them go under their own steam. That's a nice fish. There he goes. Wow. 50 minutes left before I'm having a cook up and going home. There's chance of yes. Another chub or barbel. Five minutes to six. Just about to have my cook up and put the pellets out and lunch of meat's come up again. So rolling meat is, for me, the method of the day. Five barbel, about a dozen small chub. Let's get this guy back. One last look guys, back he goes. A good, sweet session boys. Still time for one more car, so... I don't know what to say people, I'm on again. This rolled meat is so deadly down the bottom end of the swim, right, as I said, at the bottom end of where my ground bait's going in with the feeder. I don't know if people do this, I don't, it's just old school. We just used to do it down in the Avon. It's the way it is. Painly, obviously, it works 40 years later. Bring this one down for you there. I mean, unbelievable day. I'm going down smaller and smaller pieces of luncheon meat. If I go any more, I'll be any more small, I'll be taking them out of my sandwiches. There we go. There we go. There you go boys, another really good sized barbel. Let's get him straight back. God. Well guys, I've had a pretty good uh, session, haven't I? A uh, good hunch to come here. And uh, fingers crossed, we'll get home safely. I'm just having a cook up now. I've had some more small chub. And I've just got one rod, which I've now thrown, obviously way back down there further just this one i'm not going to pack up i just i'm done now and i'm going to finish off surprise surprise with bubbling spag bowl as soon as i've had this i'm going to pack up i've got quite a walk back down the bank unload unload then reload the car then <clears throat> about two and a half two and three quarter hour drive home but boy was it worth it it's always worth coming up the river Y.
well I find it is anyway guys I'm going to finish this stay safe out there don't forget hit the subscribe button on both channels TA Fishing TA Outdoors hit that little notification bell so you know when the films go up also we do a range of clothing I better set, I better plug this look Michael you give me big trouble I don't do any of this he does all this this is uh, totally awesome clothing if you want to support us great if you do if you don't don't worry I'm still making the films fund them all myself no sponsorship don't do all that I just go fishing, I film it, end of. We'll see you next time, guys. What's going to go first? The rod or the spag pole? <laughs>